um, to our live stream. I'm very excited to have a special guest with us today, Greg Kanan, who is an attorney who practices copyright IP business law contract issues in New England. And today we're gonna to be talking about copyright issues for artists. So you guys are gonna to get to ask Greg all your copyright issue questions as an artist. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here to Art Prof, critiques and tutorials. So I wanna tell you guys a little bit about Greg because Greg is actually a RISD alum. Greg got his BFA at RISD and then later on got his JD at Northeastern University. And he actually worked for many years as a documentary TV producer. And today, in addition to his law practice in New England, he speaks at schools, nonprofits, on legal matters for artists. And he writes for publications, including Movie Maker Magazine. He writes a blog called The Legal Artist. And right now he does work for artists, filmmakers, and creative entrepreneurs. So you are exactly who we need to be talking to right now about <laughs> copyright issues for artists. And if you guys would like to see more about Greg's work, I did put his full bio in the video description below and also his website. So you guys can check that out when you get a chance. All right, Greg, let's start at the very beginning, sure. which is how as an artist, do you retain copyright over your art? Do you have to register it with the government? Is it just, I made it, now I have the copyright? How does that actually work? Well, this is actually a very easy question and I think it's it's a the answer will uh, hopefully <laughs> hopefully make the audience a, 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 at ease a little bit. Uh, the moment you put pen to paper, the moment you, you, uh, you create anything, uh, copyright attaches to the work. So you don't have to do anything but create something. <clears throat> now there are benefits to registration and we can talk about that a little bit. Um, and I, I definitely recommend that anyone who's creating art that is going to be used in commerce, if they're going to put it on their website as a portfolio piece, or if it's being sold to a client or not being sold to a client, but being licensed to a client or a customer that they go through the registration process, which is, which itself is actually quite easy and uh, reasonably cost effective. But um, yeah, copyright is something that you get automatically. In fact, copyright is so important. It, it's actually written into the uh, U.S. Constitution uh, and not just the U.S. Constitution, but the first uh, article, the first uh, article of the U.S. Constitution. And then it's been, you know, there's a, a number of copyright uh, laws that have been passed. The most recent was in 1976, the U.S. Copyright Act. Uh, and then it's been amended a number of times in subsequent regulations. But the reality is copyright is considered to be a very critical right uh, given to uh, artists and creators and designers uh, and it's it's so important that it's something that you get right away without having to do anything other than create your work. So now, when should an artist actually bother going and registering their work? Like I'm a fine artist. I have hundreds and hundreds of paintings and drawings and prints. Do I go and register every single print I ever made, or do you just do that when you know it's going to be in a commercial situation. Yeah, I think that's really what that's really what you're aiming for. I mean, the copyright office, the the, the copyright. When we, by the way, for the audience, the copyright office is the U.S. Copyright Office. It is a government, uh, it's a federal government agency. You go online, you can register your work uh, right online. It's a very quick and simple process. The last time I checked, it was about thirty five dollars per work. So. While it's reasonably cost effective, if you're writing, say, a movie script, if you're generating a lot of work, if you're a photographer and you're generating tens, dozens, hundreds of images, or you're an illustrator generating tons of images, it very quickly becomes uh, cost prohibitive. And even though you can batch, you, you, there's now an, op an option on the website to batch register your work, it's still $35 per. So, I, you know, you have to be very, uh, you have to think very critically about what what work you think needs protection uh, needs that registration and um, so I, I think a lot of it is going to be about what 
you what work you're going to put out there in the sphere even if you're not even if it's not something that um you know is necessarily for sale or for or for license um if you're just putting it on your port on your website or in your portfolio where other people can see it that's probably a, a good starting point for thinking about registration we have a question from Lisa who is saying, when can you include consumer products images in your art? For example, a portrait includes a person drinking a soda brand. Oh boy, we just come right out the gate with, with the big questions. Um, I, I think uh, a lot of you are gonna, I was joking about this with Clara earlier, but you, a lot of my answers are going to start with it depends. And the reason is because the law, um, a lot of us think the law is a very clear cut thing, but the reality is that it's not. And there are lots of exceptions and, and changes in the law that, that may make something okay and then make something not okay. And it really depends on the specific facts of a given situation. So, just, and, and actually before I even really answer this question, I'll just sort of throw out as a caveat that I'm gonna answer questions here and I may answer questions about your specific situation, but uh, that does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you would like to create an attorney-client relationship, I, I assume, Claire, you put my, my information up there so you can contact me directly about your situation. But I just wanna make it clear that I'm just gonna be providing generalized legal information here. Um, <clears throat> Generally speaking, using the work of somebody else, whether it is uh, another piece of art or if it's a consumer brand, is generally not okay. Uh, that would be considered copyright infringement. And copyright infringement is, while not a criminal, uh, there wouldn't be a criminal penalty for breaking it. It is against the law. It is technically illegal to use someone else's work without their permission. Um, but there's always exceptions to that. Fair use is a big one. Uh, and fair use in and of itself is a very complicated uh, doctrine. And there's lots of uh, sort of exceptions that might make something permissible. And, and by the way, when, when I just for the sake of clarity, when I talk about fair use, what I mean is the right to use somebody's somebody else's work without their permission. So using their work in a way that you don't get the permission, but it is still not tech, is not technically copyright infringement. That's what fair use is. Uh, but there, are, uh, fair use in and of itself is really hard to parse. And the only, ultimately, the only person who can make a fair use judgment is a judge or a jury. So even I, as an attorney who practices IP, if you were to come to me and say, "Hey, I'm using somebody else's work, or I'm using a picture of a Coca Cola can in my work." Is that okay? Does that qualify for fair use? I might give you an analysis that says yes or no. But if I if my analysis is yes, that's not that's not like a, a free car a free pass to go and use. It's not a get out of jail free card. It just means that me as an attorney, having done my analysis, believe that it qualifies for fair use. But you might still face you know some sort of litigation or lawsuit if someone were to find it. So generally, the answer is you shouldn't. Uh, not great. Uh, I always tell tell uh, clients and prospective clients um, if you're familiar with the, uh, the 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 slogan it's better to ask uh, forgiveness than permission uh, that is bad advice do not do that always ask, <laughs> always ask permission uh, when it comes to using work that you do not create well let's dig deeper into fair use, because this is a question that I get all the time, yeah. because I'm sure, Greg, as you know, artists are looking at images. Let's say you're an editorial illustrator and they want you to do a illustration about flamingos. Mm -hmm. Most of us don't have access to a flamingo. And so we're gonna go onto Google Images, find a picture of a flamingo and maybe use it as a reference for your artwork, which is not quite the same thing as say putting yeah, yeah. a Coke bottle into yeah. a painting. So let's take a look at an example here. This is a photo that somebody found on Instagram, in the upper left, and on the bottom is a colored pencil drawing that an artist made. So is this not cool for this yeah. artist to do this? Yeah, this is very not cool. Um, <laughs> so let, let me just be clear that using one work uh, to create your own work inherently is not wrong. It's only wrong if you attempt to commercialize it. So if this artist Luna 
just did the painting, just did the, uh, the I'm sorry, the color pencil drawing to, uh, as part of her portfolio, or if she's, you know, doing it to increase her, uh, her skill set, fine, you know, go right ahead. If she tries to sell this, uh, she is technically infringing the copyright of the Ezra Miller, Ezra Miller photograph. Um, uh, which is be because she, it, very, for a very simple reason, she didn't get permission from the, the owner of that photograph to, to uh, use it and therefore profit off of it. That's really the crux of it. I think the, the, the simplest way to understand copyright law in this country, copyright law in the US is a little different than copyright law in, in many other countries in that in the United States, copyright, the sort of the, the central thesis of copyright is that if you are the creator of a work of art, you have financial rights. You have certain financial rights in that work. Uh, certain, I should say certain exclusive financial rights, meaning you are the only person who should be able to financially profit off of that work. Uh, you Now, as the owner, you can give away that right. You can sell it. You can license those rights. Um, but the only person who has control over it is you. Um, in other countries, there's a there's a much more there's a much bigger emphasis on something called moral rights, which is less financial in nature and more about your personal reputation as an artist. But uh, so because you know, so time to time you may get a contract with a client or something or a customer where they talk about moral rights, but it's not very common here in the U.S. Um, so that's that's really key. Um, if you know the there is a distinction, by the way, between using work. So this is an, another slide you put up, uh, Clara, with the reference photo and then Luna's drawing, which again is quite good. But if, again, this is essentially a one for one copy. This is what we'd actually call a derivative work. Uh, a derivative work is uh, simply a um, using a pre existing work and then creating something off of it, using it as a starting point. Um, and derivative works are one of the rights in, in, a cop in the copyright ownership law uh, that the owner and only the owner of the copyright has. So again, if Luna wants to just do these drawings or if she's doing them for a class or if she's just doing it to put in her portfolio and say to prospective customers, look what I can do, great, fine. But if she's trying to sell this, uh, she's gonna have a problem if she didn't acquire the rights early on. I do wanna say though, generally speaking, refer using pre-existing work as reference is, is okay. Um, and I'll give you an example from from, an, from a client I had. She was an illustrator who uh, she was like a cartoonist, and she would you know period, she'd come up with a concept for for a cartoon panel, and uh, she would download like images from Getty or you know another stock, stock images. So if she needed to draw uh, part of the image was I need to draw a picture of a woman sitting on a chair. She didn't want to necessarily have to do that from her memory, so she would download images. Of a woman sitting and a woman and a chair, and then she would try to figure out. She would sort of lay them into her work and trace them, and then change them, and figure out perspective and you know design. And once she had her image, she would remove the existing, uh, the pre-existing uh, reference material. But by that point, her her work was had changed the the, the drawing, the, her drawing, I should say, had changed the, the design and layout so much that it was a functionally new thing. And that's okay. That kind of using reference material to just get a sense of perspective and shape and size and shadow, that's all fine. We have a question from Ra Nook. If we sell artwork internationally, which country's copyright laws apply? Or if the theft of copying is international, which country's laws will work? The country or origin of art or the other one? Wow, this is gonna get complicated. Yeah, boy, I wish I hadn't gotten this question. Um, so I'll just caveat that by saying I'm not a, I don't practice international IP. Um, I have a little bit of knowledge, but it's just, it's just never come up in my own practice. So um, I will say that, um, th so there's no such thing as an international copyright. Um, it, every country has its own copyright laws, and that's so it's like 190 some odd different copyright laws. There are international copyright treaties. Uh, the main one is called the Bern Convention, uh, and it ha and I think like 170 some odd countries, including the U.S., are signatories to that. And the whole point of that is to sort of uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Try to like normalize copyright law. So if your if your work is created in the U.S. but it's violated in Switzerland you know, 
you figuring out which it, 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 the reality is that it's not quite so simple about which country's laws apply. So if you're in Switzerland and the work is, is, a, is a U.S. creation, do Switzerland's copyright laws apply or do the U.S.'s apply? It depends on a what what's considered the country of origin, where where the work was published, um, how. So, yeah, it's, it's, it gets really complicated really quickly, but here, I'm going to actually make it quite easy for you. Um, it doesn't really matter because defending your copyright in Switzerland, whether it would be uh, using U.S. copyright law or Swiss copyright law, doesn't matter because it's going to cost you a fortune. Most independent artists cannot afford to defend their copyrights when they're violated overseas. Um, it is very common right now uh, for uh, China, for example, uh, for there to be a lots of just rampant copyright, not just copyright, but all sorts of IP, patent, trademark, uh, uh, copyright law infringement. And most individuals, uh, artists, most even many companies, unless you're Apple or Facebook or, you know, a, you know, a huge conglomerate where you can afford to litigate over there. That's that's really the, the critical issue. <laughs> can you afford to defend your copyright in Switzerland or Germany or you know, Abu Dhabi, wherever it's infringed, because the reality is you'd have to defend it over there. Well, so Greg, this is an interesting question because you had mentioned earlier that if an artist took someone's photo and copied it, it was a derivative work mm -hmm. and they were trying to sell it to make money. That's a pretty clear cut context. Yeah. But the thing is, social media has complicated this because what if you have a derivative work and this person saying cerulean what about something like performance art i'm thinking about stuff that's put on social media like TikTok. what do you do about that well i mean so so performance art in general is so for copyright to apply uh the work has to be fixed in a tangible medium of expression that is the actual language from the copyright act and what that means is it has to be recorded somehow it has to be written down or video recorded or sound recorded or something um so you know if you're if you're doing a performance art piece and you've written out the stages or steps of that performance piece that writing would would qualify for copyright protection and if it's videotaped some I say videotaped or like I'm like a 1990s. <laughs> if, it's, if, if it's recorded and put up on you know Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, whatever, um, you know that recording would also have copyright protection. And but the actual performance itself, just you know, if I'm walking down the street and I see a street performer doing a, a dance, that dance live is not copyright protected. But if I whip out my camera and I record it. I now have ownership over the recording. The artist doesn't, I do. So that, that's where you know, ownership rights can you know, intersect and conflict. Uh, so you have to be careful about what you, who, who, who's doing the recording and making sure that it's clear that um, you are retaining the rights to that recording. Now, let's go back to fair use for a minute because the pieces we saw earlier, pretty clear cut situation of derivative works, really a photo that's copied verbatim. Yeah. But what about a situation like this? Because this is Stephen Croninger, who is a wonderful illustrator and you guys mm -hmm. should check out, he's got a lot of great political illustrations. What about collage? Because in collage, you are altering the material. I'm gonna assume maybe this is a digital collage or maybe it's cut out of a magazine. What if I was the photographer that took this photo of Hillary Clinton? Could I sue this illustrator for copyright infringement? Or is this enough of a transformation that you can yeah. say, hey, not derivative? Yeah, so you're actually asking two different questions. Um, I'll sort of answer the bigger one first, which is, can you be sued? Which the answer is yes. I mean, in this country, you can be sued by anyone for anything. So let's say for the sake of argument that this work qualifies as a fair use, you can still be sued for copyright infringement. And in fact, fair use is what we call an affirmative defense, which means that you are not allowed to assert fair use uh, until you've been sued. So essentially, someone sues you, you get a summons and a complaint, and you'd have to go to court, presumably hire an attorney. And the attorney is going to show up in court that day and say, uh, in, and file what's called a motion to dismiss, basically saying this 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 lawsuit has no merit. 
And as part of that motion to dismiss, he's going to say, he or she is going to say, this is a fair use and here's why it falls under the fair use category. Now the judge may say, okay, I buy that argument, motion to dismiss granted and the case is dismissed. Or he might say, you know, that's, that's kind of, there's, quite, there's a question here about whether this is actual fair use. And then the case would go forward and you might have to actually sit in front of a jury and have a jury decide whether, whether, that, whether this constitutes fair use or not. Um, so that's the big question. Can you be sued? Yes, you can always be sued. In fact, don't even ask the question, can I be sued? The answer is always <laughs> yes, you can be sued. The question of whether this lawsuit has merit is a whole different question. But do I think this is fair use? I, you know, I, I don't know. I, you know, there's a couple things going on here. You, you mentioned collage and, you know, collage is technically a derivative work, right? Um, so What's interesting about derivative works, and especially when it comes to collage or some sort of compilation, is that obviously the, the photographer who took the photo of the planes or a Bernie of Hillary, those, the co unless the, the, uh, Stephen Croninger uh, uh, acquired the rights to those photos, um, they still have the right. So they can they still have grounds to sue under copyright infringement. However, because of the nature of the work, Stephen can actually claim a copyright ownership in the way he's assembled the work and anything, of course, that is original to him. So if, for example, um, let's say for sake of argument for this slide you pulled up, let's say that's his bike. That's Stephen Croninger's bike and he pulled it out of his garage and took that photo himself. He would own the photo, the right to the photo of that bike. But all the other pieces of that would still be owned by. And then, of course, I'm sorry, he would own the right to the photo of the bike, but also the, the copyright in the assembly, the nature of the assembly uh, of the image, but the individual pieces of the images would still reside with, the ownership would still reside with the original owners. And so you have multiple owners for a single image and you, you know, you'd have copyright infringement problems. Whether this is fair use or not is hard for me to determine. If, if he's trying to as, uh, assert some sort of like satire or parody, um, which is generally considered to be a, a, a permissible fair use, I, I might be able to buy that argument. And, I, and if he hired me as his attorney, I might be able to make that argument. Lisa H is asking, do copyright rights have a time limit? Like, do they expire after a number of years after the creation date? Yes, they do. Um, under the current configuration of the Copyright Act, uh, for individuals, copyright lasts for the life of the author plus 75 years. Uh, so that means for 75 years after you die, meaning uh, through your great through your great grandchildren would would have rights to that work, and then it would fall into the public domain. Uh, corporations have 120 years, uh, but you know I think there's some you know originally the, those times were shorter, but I want to say back in the I want to say 70s or 80s, Disney was about to lose the rights to Mickey Mouse, and they successfully petitioned Congress to extend those rights. I imagine that as the date <laughs> the date uh, comes closer for Disney losing the rights to Mickey Mouse again, those dates will be extended. Question from Arthur Dot. What is the legal state of Artist Alley at things like Comic-Con or Anime Expo, where a lot of stuff sold as fan art? Tried doing some research, couldn't really find a concrete answer. Yeah, fan art, it's everywhere. Yeah. I mean, you get on Instagram for two seconds and everybody's doing it. So what do we do about that? I mean, I can't imagine Disney's going to go and sue every artist on Instagram. <laughs> Although, I don't know, I don't know if, I, if I'd feel as confident in that, in that statement. Uh, there have been plenty of big corporations that have uh, mercilessly sued individuals uh, over stuff like this. So... Um, there was a big thing a couple of years ago. There was a, a Star Trek fan film that was being made. You know, there was a, you know a bunch of Star Trek fans had pulled together some money. They'd done some fundraiser. They were going to do their own fan film. It even starred some of the original Star Trek actors. Um, and Paramount, who owned the, the uh, feature film rights, this was back in I want to say 2014 or 2015. They 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 were you know they had they sued the hell out of them. They ended up settling. There was some sort of uh, private settlement. I'm not really sure where that ended up, but corporations, big corporations who have very um, valuable IP, they are not shy about protecting that IP. I mean, as a, as a matter of logistics, you can't sue every fan. There just, there aren't enough lawyers to do that. There aren't enough, there's not enough people 
there's too, just too many fans doing too much work. And even Disney with, you know, that has a, a legal department, probably uh, the size of a small town probably doesn't have enough lawyers and billable hours to, to sue them all. So in terms of raw numbers, if you are a fan doing fan art and selling it uh, of IP that you don't own, you probably will get away with it. But I mean, as a legal matter, it's, it's still copyright infringement. Actually, let's go back to fair use. Blue Wolf Spirit is asking, can you explain fair use? Yeah, that would be great to just get a full out definition because I think a lot of people, it's a very confusing term. Sure. Well, it's funny you, you mentioned this because I actually, uh, I did a, a presentation on fair use recently. Can you still see me? I pulled up something else. Um, yeah, we can see you. Uh, I'm, I, there's a definition that I, because I've been, I've been trying to figure out a, a very simple way to describe fair use. And I came up with this definition, which is simply that fair use is the lawful use of another person's copyrighted work without getting their permission. That's the definition of what fair use is. How do you use it is, is actually quite a, a much more difficult answer, a uh, diff difficult topic, I should say. Um, there are, under the Copyright Act, there are four uh, types, there are four uh, factors, I should say, that um, the courts will use to determine whether fair use applies. Uh, I'm just going to read them off because even after all this time, I haven't memorized them. Part, part of, it's also 1030 at night on the Eastern seaboard and I'm close, it's past my bedtime. So my memory's not so hot. Um, but the four factors are the purpose and character of the use, including whether such use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes. Uh, two is the nature of the copyrighted work. Three is the amount and substantiability, uh, I'm sorry, substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. And four is the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. Uh, I'm just going to quickly sort of run through each of these factors um, just because the, it, it's, it, that's just, you know, legal, legal gobbledygook. Factor one is, you know, the purpose and character. We're talking about whether your version of the work I'm sorry, whether, I'm sorry, whether your use of the work transforms the original work. So, um, you know, one, one, one valence of that is financial, right? So if you are taking somebody's work without their permission and you're turning it into something else, but you're not making any money off of it, that alone doesn't necessarily get you off the hook. doesn't mean you're, you're in the clear, but, uh, but it, is a, it is a factor that courts will look at to determine whether this is fair use or not. Um, you know, I think, you know, if you're, if you're using a work for non-commercial purposes, if you're using it for parody, for, if you're, if it's, it's part of a news gathering scenario, if you're doing it as criticism, like if you're doing movie criticism, uh, if you're doing it for educational purposes. So for example, Clara, you're using images, uh, but this is part of an educational forum. So that's okay. Um, and it, of course, if anything is in the public domain, it's perfectly legal to use without permission. Um, you know, if the work is fact-based, if I'm sorry, if the work you're using is fact-based and not uh, fiction-based, uh, so like for example, if you want to tell a story about the life of Abraham Lincoln, that's fine because facts and ideas are not copyrightable. Uh, you can that there's a reason why a million history books and a million movies and TV shows have featured Abraham Lincoln and you know the, the founding fathers because that stuff happened. Um, you know, if uh, if you're using a little bit of the work as opposed to the whole thing, let's say you are you want to use somebody else's illustration, but you only want to use a small portion of it. That's that bodes better for you than uh, if you, you want to just take the whole thing. Uh, and then last but not least, the effect of the use upon the potential market for the value of the work. That that's basically are you depriving the original artist of uh, prospective financial gain for themselves? Um, there was a famous case. I want to say about 30 years ago, where there was a photographer who took a photo of himself and his wife holding a bunch of puppies, uh, and he posted them on a foot postcard, and he sold the postcard. And another artist found the postcard, took the image, and created it into a, like a wood sculpture, and then sold something like three hundred thousand dollars worth of wooden sculptures. And he was, was this the Jeff Koons case. Yeah, it was the Koons case. Yeah, your puppies. Yeah, and so. Um, so Coons was the was the artist who made the sculpture, and the original uh, artist Art Rogers sued him for copyright infringement. And Coons argued in front of the court that he said, "Well, yes, it, I used his image without his permission, but 
you know, Rogers is a photographer. He was not going to exploit, you know, ex oh, there it is. Oh, you got it right there. <laughs> uh, he was not going to exploit the image in sculptural form. And the court actually found against him. They found that uh, he didn't infringe Art Rogers' uh, photograph. And they said, even though Rogers is a photographer, part, part of the reason was that even though Art Rogers was a was a photographer and not a sculptor, he could, he had the potential of exploiting the image in sculptural format. And that was one of the reasons why it was ultimately decided that um, even though he didn't, he wasn't, he, he, he might not have made money that way, he still could. That was a potential avenue for, for finance, finance for him. So it's, you know, just to sort of circle back to what I said at the very beginning, even if your use is a fair use. Even if you hire me and I tell you I think it's fair use, the only person who's going to make that determination ultimately is a judge or a jury. Um, and to get to that point is a, a very time-consuming and very cost costly uh, place to be. Um, most artists will settle. We have a question from Dara. If I'm a broke nobody with a web portfolio, can I put scary language on my website about copyright and registration? Will that deter pirates or will they just cackle as they swipe my work? Yeah, I mean, question. you know, the, I get this question all the, a lot, which is, you know, how can I sort of pirate proof my work when I put it online? And you can't. It's impossible. I mean, there are things you can do. There are certain strategies you can employ. You can... Um, you can watermark your work. You can put it on your website in a way that, uh, you know, you, like at a, at a lower resolution. So it's, it's harder to use in high definition forums. Um, you can't, you just, there's just nothing you can do. I mean, the only foolproof way of keeping people from taking your work is to just not put it online. And, you know, the reality is you, you have to do that. I mean, that's just the nature of the world we live in. So you have, I think you need to pick and choose what you put online. Um, if, if you have a hundred photographs, what are the, what are the five that make the most amount of sense to, you know, that, that tell your artistic story, you know, register those five and then put them on your website. And, you know, there, you know, some websites, uh, it depends on what you, who your hosts are, what your hosting services you use, but sometimes they allow you to like disable the download, you know, disable right click so they can't download it. Um, there are different strategies you can use, um, but I think ultimately if someone wants your work, they're going to take it. I mean, that's what I think terrifies a lot of artists is that you're really sort of stuck in a rock and a hard place. Yeah. But I guess what we're also wondering is if you see this, I see my work all over the place. Like if I just look myself up, I'm on Tumblr. I don't know why people always need to put a poem over one of my drawings. They always seem to have to do that. Yeah. But wh when is it? What do you do when that happens? Like, I get pissed, obviously, but when do you realize, hey, I got to talk to a lawyer about this? Like, for you, what's the breaking point where you actually take legal action? Oh, that's a good question. I, I mean, I personally, in my practice, I've never had to take legal action, uh, by which I mean file a lawsuit. Um, I, what I have done on the behalf of clients in the past is I've sent uh, what's called a cease and desist letter. Uh, which is essentially like, hey, I noticed you've used my client's work without the permission. Please take it down immediately or you'll face litigation. Uh, and most of the time that that doesn't. I mean, most people don't have the money to hire attorneys and defend themselves, especially when they've been caught. So, um, you know, they, they do it. Uh, it's been my, also my experience that many, many, not not most, but a, a significant portion of people, when they do this, they're doing it not out of malice, but out of sort of negligence. They just, they don't know how things work. They don't know the law. They, I mean, and, you know, and I, I often take a very dim view of that because we live in a world where you can just Google what copyright infringement is. I mean, you don't have to be completely ignorant, but a lot of people are, um, and they don't know. And when they get caught, they say, oh, I didn't know. I'm sorry. I'll take it down. Um, but you know, you know, you can, you can always contact them yourself and say, "Hey, look, I noticed you put your work on my work on your website. You didn't ask me permission. Please take it down, or otherwise pay me X amount of dollars to license it for use or whatever." I always say that um, trying to negotiate with those people <clears throat> can be uh, an unexpected source of 
uh, passive income. Uh, it, it's actually happened with a number of my clients where they've they've gone to a person and said, hey, you know, I noticed you use my work. Um, I don't mind if you use it, but you have to pay me however much to do it. Uh, in fact, this happened to a, an illustrator friend of mine. He had a, uh, he found out some guy was using uh, an one of his illustrations as a cover for his ebook. And he contacted him. They worked it out. And the guy pays him like, like $100 a year just to keep using it for his ebook, which is not nothing. But I mean, which, which is not much, I should say. $100 a year is not much. But you know, he turned it into a client instead of a, uh, instead of like a fight. So you can always do that. Um, you can always include a demand with a, with a, with a cease and desist. You know, there's always the DMCA, which is the digital millennium copyright act, which is a law passed in the mid nineties, which allows uh, artists to go directly to the ISP. So instead of, which is, it's a cease and desist for the ISP instead of uh, the the infringer. So a cease and desist goes directly to the infringer. Hey, I saw you took my work. Take it down right away. A DMCA takedown notice would go to the ISP and say, Hey, I noticed one of these guys is using my work on his YouTube channel. Please take down that video, and they would take it down. Uh, so that that's an option. And then last but not least, if your work is you know has substantial financial value and it's being infringed, you can always sue. So actually, I like this. I suppose steps to go through because I guess a lot of us, when we hear the word legal issues, we go, oh, we have to sue them right away. And yeah. I like this alternative to say, hey, contact them, see if they'll pay you for it. And then I guess the next step is cease and desist. And if none of that works and you still want to go, then you sue. So sue yeah. is not the first yeah. thing that you do. No, in fact, it, it can't be. Most if you If you sue somebody, um, if you would, by which I mean you hire an attorney and they file a, a complaint in court, that means the infringer is going to come home one day to a complaint and a summons, you know, in their mail, uh, or more likely they're going to be served with documents, you know, uh, have a, a service agent come out and serve them. Um, how do I put this? There's a reason <laughs> most judges are old and lazy and they don't want to go to court. Okay, they don't want to be. They don't want to sit in trial for two weeks arguing over who owns what. Um, and in fact, I've been. This is back in my law school days when I was interning. But I've been involved in a trial where, in the middle of the trial, the judge with a jury sitting there, a judge, the judge turned to the parties and said, "This is ridiculous. Go in the back room and don't come out until you have a settlement." So judges don't want to go to trial. They don't want to have to impanel a jury. They don't want to have to go through the whole process. Trials are very long. They're very expensive. They take forever. No one enjoys them. Um, and so they're always pushing the parties to settle. And if you show up in court with, uh, you know, having, su having submitted a complaint against someone and the judge finds out that you haven't even tried to negotiate or settle with them before you got to the point where you sued them and made them hire an attorney to defend themselves, that judge is going to be pretty pissed off and may even throw the case out. Uh, and force you to try to settle before resubmit. What they can do is they can dismiss the dismiss the uh, the case uh, without prejudice, which means that you're allowed to refile the case if after x amount a certain period of time passes you haven't uh, settled. But you'd have to try to settle in good faith to do that. So don't ever sue first thing because the judge is going to be mad at you. You don't want a judge mad at you. I mean, I like the idea of getting paid from somebody <laughs> taking my work. I mean, yeah. that's a much better way to resolve it, it. You know what? It does come up because I've had, you know, people, you know, rightfully so are very possessive of their work and they want to protect it at all costs. And when you're upset and when this is your livelihood, you want to defend it. And some people go right to that, you know, right to that mode where they say, I want to file in court. And I'll usually say that I can't be your lawyer. I can't be your lawyer if that's the first thing you want to do. Sarah is asking, if I post my original art on Instagram, does Instagram own it? Also, how can I prevent online art theft? Would I need to copyright? Yeah, I mean, Instagram, you know, you can post your work on any social media. They do not own rights to your work. What they do, uh, and because, you know, periodically you see this kind of thing floating around on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram where they say, oh, Facebook changed its, its, uh, its uh, terms of service so that it owns all your work. Please post this and copy and paste it so you know that you don't consent to it, which is all, you know, conspiracy nonsense. I mean, the, these, these social media networks do not own your work at all. What they do is they license your, 
license your work so they can advertise it to, so they can sort of package you to advertisers. So what they'll do is they might, what they might do is they might take your work and send it to, I don't know, some company so they can target advertising to you. But that's not the same thing as owning your work. What you're doing is consenting to them you doing that. Um, you know, in regards to your, the other part of your question, you know, you have, you, you have to copyright protect. Well, I mean, again, copyright is a thing that you have automatically. What we're talking about is registration. You should register, uh, whatever you think is the most valuable of your work. Um, and that is the most public facing part of your work. And then the other part of your question, which I just, which I just answered, but I'll reiterate, you, there's nothing you can do to prevent people who want to pirate your work. Um, there are steps you can take to make your work less usable online, but you can't prevent pirate piracy. Right. Like we have this comment here from Raindrops who says screenshots and print screen has more power than the right click download being disabled. It's true. I mean, you can screenshot yeah. anything. So yeah. yeah, there's not a lot you guys can do to yeah. prevent that. Yeah. So there's here's a question that I get really often, which is, can you copyright an art style? So we have these two caricatures here. The one on the left is by Bob Stock. The one on the right is by Robert Risco. They're both very well-known illustrators. And there are a lot of artists out there. There's a lot of similarities in terms of how they work. So can you do that? Can you say, this is my style. I'm going to copyright it. Nobody else can draw like that. No, you cannot. Uh, style is not protected by copyright for the, for the reasons you just said, Clara, which is this, that there are many artists. Artists are influenced by each other. Uh, all the time. And honestly, there are, it, given the amount of artists out there, it is very likely that two artists who've never seen each other's work can develop very similar styles. Um, and if we permitted, if the law permitted artists to sue each other over their styles, um, the courts, the federal courts would be just filled with nonstop you know, frivolous uh, copyright infringement lawsuits. It would never end. I mean, it, 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 the slippery slope is so slippery, you'd end up in, in Antarctica. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't possibly get out from under that. And so uh, Congress, in a, in, a rare, <laughs> in, a, in a very rare display of wisdom, uh, decided that when drafting the Copyright Act, style is not copyrightable. Now, there's, there, I'm sure there's a point where use, you know, like sort of emulating somebody's style does fall into copy. So copyright protects individual images. So you can take a style and at a certain point it becomes so close to existing images that it could fall under copyright infringement, but just drawing like somebody, another artist in and of itself is not, uh, is not protectable. December says, how much is it to register artwork and is it a one-time fee? Uh, again, the last time I checked, it was $35 per work uh, at the U.S. Copyright Office website. Uh, it is a one-time fee per work. I mean, that adds up after a while. <laughs> if I think about yeah. how much artwork I actually have, I mean, it doesn't seem like something yeah. reasonably most artists could do for every piece that they make, right? No, it, it, it's, not, it's not financially feasible, I think, for most artists. I would also add, this is a good point, this is a good this is a good point to add this, which is that um, you cannot sue for copyright infringement until after you've registered your work. So if you have a piece of work out there and you find someone is infringing it, using it without your permission, and um, you want to go after them, you want you, you tried the negotiation, you tried the settlement, it's not working out, now it's time to hire a lawyer and sue them. You can't sue them in federal court until you go through the registration process. Um, and in fact, if you do, your, your case will just be dismissed. Uh, so, and, but here's the thing. Registration carries with it uh, really two main benefits. One is that you get what's called the presumption of, it's just called a presumption. Uh, but uh, the idea is that this document, because it is essentially a federal government document, in and of itself is proof that you own this, the rights to this work. I mean, it is pretty much the only thing you have to show. You'd have to show up in court, show this document and say, this is my proof. And that's almost certainly enough to, to win you the case. I mean, I, I, I'm generalizing. Uh, it, an actual copyright infringement case, if it went in front of a federal court, would um, would almost certainly be more complicated. But, um, but 
ostensibly it is it is a, a very valuable piece of evidence. It might be the most valuable piece of evidence you can have. Uh, the other benefit of registration is that you would sue for statutory damages. These are uh, damages that are laid out in the Copyright Act, and they vary from $750 per infringed work up to $150,000 per infringed work. Uh, $150,000 is um, for cases of willful infringement. It's very hard to prove, but if you can prove it, you can get that much money. If you don't, if you don't register your work, be so how does it work? So if you register your work after it's been infringed, you can still sue in court, but you cannot get statutory damages. You'd have to prove actual damages, which is meet. In other words, you'd have to tell a prove to a judge or jury how much money you've lost because this other artist has used your work, and that's very hard to do. Uh, even if you keep very rigorous financial files, um, which is probably something most artists don't do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my experience with my clients. Um, so, you know, I, I say all that to say, if you're going to register your work, do it before you put it into the public sphere as, as you know, as soon as you can before you put it into the, in the public sphere, because that will just give you more protection. This is a related question. So what happens if somebody steals your artwork, says Blue Will Spirit, and registers it before you do? Yikes, people, yeah. God, that's such a crappy thing to do. Yeah. But have you heard of cases like that before? I mean, anecdotally, I have. Um, there are, you know, the IP world is filled with trolls. Uh, you've, the most common of which are patent trolls. The patent and trademark trolls, and to a lesser extent, copyright trolls, are people who do exactly this, where they, have access to a work, they register the patent or the trademark or the copyright before you do, and then they sit on it until you pay them an exorbitant amount of money to acquire the rights. Um, it does happen, and honestly, I, I personally don't really know what I would do. I've never, I've never had a client come to me and ask me that question. Um, it's, it's a tough one. I don't think it happens as much in the copyright world, um, because there, there are issues related to publication that, that complicate it. It's, it's much easier in the patent world. Uh, we got a question from AJ. Can you sue or get sued for libel in an artwork? And actually, before you answer the question, Greg, can you explain what libel is for people who don't know? Yeah, so libel is a form of defamation, which is simply uh, when a public statement to a third party uh, uh, that is designed to harm the reputation of another of another person. So, if Clara turns to all you fine people and tells a horrible lie about me, I can now sue her for defamation. Libel. The difference between there's two types of libel. There's, li there's li I'm sorry. Two types of defamation: libel and slander. Slander is spoken. Libel is written. Uh, so if so if Clara were to just say you know, Greg's a terrible attorney and he's uh, he's not even licensed to practice, that would be a lie. It would be harmful to my reputation and it would be to a, a third party. But because she spoke it, it would be slander. If she wrote it down in the comment section, it would be libel, but that's really what it is. Uh, yes, you can absolutely be sued for libel, slander, any kind of defamation in an artwork. Um, it happens all the time. So I want to ask a question that is actually not so much about the legal action, mm -hmm. but I guess sort of the morality of it. Mm -hmm. Because I think now with the internet, the images are everywhere. And mm -hmm. it's so easy. People are calling each other out on social media. These things blow up really, really fast. What if you're an artist and another artist, say on social media says, mm -hmm. this person took my illustration, they stole it, they plagiarize and, what do you do in that circumstance? Like there's no legal action, but they're well, actually just making well, there, a big public thing. There might be because if, I think the very first thing you need to do is figure out if it's true. Uh, if it's not true. So for example, let's say you reached out, you found another, you're doing a collage, right? You reached out to um, an artist who you like, whose work you want to use, and you work out a deal. And they're, they're, they're going to license their work to you. You're going to pay them a little, you know, a little bit of money and you're going to incorporate that work into yours. A couple months later, the work is finished. You post it online for everyone to see. And that artist doesn't like the way you used the work. 
And so they go online and say, you know, Greg, he stole my work. He never got me. He never got permission to do it. And, you know, and he, he's a thief and a liar and he's the worst kind of, you know, troll you can imagine. Now that's a lie. That meets, that meets the, <laughs> that meets the, um, the dictionary definition of defamation. So you could sue him for defamation. You definitely have a, a claim for, for that. Um, if, if it's a little less dramatic than that, or if it's you accidentally use something that you thought maybe was in the public domain, but turns out it wasn't, you have to do a little bit of, of soul searching and maybe a little bit of research to figure out, you know, did I, did I use someone's work accidentally? It does happen. It happens quite a bit, especially in my experience. Uh, when when confronting artists who who my clients say use their work without permission, it's oftentimes been a, an accidental thing. It's very very easy um, when you're an artist to be in the heat of creation, and you're just inspired, and you want you don't want to lose the inspiration, you don't want to lose the motivation. You find work, you start using it, and you figure out you figure I'm gonna deal with all the, the other stuff later, right? I just got to get the work done. I got to get it out, out there. And because of the nature of the internet, it's really easy to find stuff. It's really easy to download stuff. And you just do that. You know, it happens. It happens quite a bit. So I think you need to figure out, I think you need to, uh, as sort of a preventative measure, use a lot more foresight when you're online and when you're, use, when you're finding work that you're going to use as inspiration or as reference material or you're going to use it outright because you're doing some form of what you think is going to be a fair use. Um, you need to think very hard. Do I need this work? Uh, if so, is there a way I can acquire it uh, legally? That is buy the rights or license the rights. Uh, if not, how important is it that I use it? How important is it to the creative process that I use it? I understand by saying that it's not easy. Again, I've, I've been an artist. I know what it's like to be in that moment of creation and you don't want to step on, <laughs> step on your own toe doing that. So, you know, do your best. Well, I mean, this is one of the reasons why at ArtProf, we're always bothering you guys, take your own reference photos when you can, because yeah. then you're not, you know, using somebody else's work and at risk for being accused of making derivative pieces. So here's a question from Dremai. If I make a sat satirical political work about a politician, can they sue me for defamation? Great right. question because, wow, what about political cartoons where oftentimes politicians do not look so yeah. great? Well, I mean, again, you know, the answer is, yeah, they can sue you. Of course they can sue you. They can sue anyone. I mean, they're not, you know, the likelihood is that if you're like a political cartoonist, for example, you're probably working for, if you're working for a publication, you personally aren't getting sued. The art, the, the publication is getting sued. Uh, or you might be also joined as like a third party defendant, um, which does happen. Uh, but yeah, of course you can get sued. You can get sued for anything or by anybody over anything for any reason whatsoever. Um, it's very easy to file a lawsuit in this country. Uh, it's very hard to file a lawsuit that has actual merit. Um, and generally satire, political, like political cartoons are considered to be a fair use. Um, Again, I say generally, it really depends on the execution and the specific facts of the cartoon. Um, but you're probably okay, but the answer isn't, are you legally safe? Is this a legal fair use? The answer is, can you afford to be sued? Um, you know, if you're doing, if you're, if you're uh, like a, like an independent cartoonist, for example, and you are, if you're doing this for like your portfolio or something, it's again, you're fine. Nobody cares. Um, nobody cares enough to sue you to stop. If you're doing it for your, your work and you happen to work for, I don't know, the New York magazine or New York post or something, they're the ones who are going to inc incur the legal wrath because they're the ones who own the work. You're the artist. You're not the, you're not the owner. We have a question here from Fab Geek. Is there a risk to use a reference photo from the sites that allow you to use their photos? And actually that's sort of a follow-up from Emily's question. Do I have any obligations as an artist under Creative Commons? So yeah, we'd love to hear about that. <laughs> I mean, you know, the risk is pretty much what I've been saying this whole, this whole last hour. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's always a risk to using work that isn't yours. Uh, that's just the way it is. I, the the way you use the work is really what's critical. I mean, that's going to determine whether 
it's fair use, whether it's, whether, you know, if, if you're, if you go to the like Getty images, for example, and you li- buy a license, you're fine. I mean, maybe actually I want to, I want to backtrack on that because I know they have different types of licenses that, that allow different things. So if you purchase, a, you know, the cheapest license and that license does not permit you to use that work in a, in a derivative fashion, then you can't do it. Then you're, then it's still copyright infringement, even though you bought a license. Um, so it depends on the nature of the license you're using. If you, if, if you're using one at all, it depends on the way you use the work. It depends on, uh, how inflammatory you're being, because the more inflammatory you are, the more likely you are to get seen and then therefore caught and therefore sued. So, you know, that, you know, that I, I, I want to be able to answer that question a little bit more in depth, but that's about as, about as deeply as I can answer it because it's, it's, it is so, it's so dependent on the facts. We have a question from December. If I register in a country, but then move, I'd have to re-register the work under the rules of the new country, right? Uh, yeah, generally, generally speaking, that's the way you would do it. Yeah. And we have another question here. And I know, just so you guys know, Greg is not going to comment on specific cases because that's unethical. So we're going to just take this comment and Greg, just answer what you feel you can answer. So Angie is saying the Inktober scandal comes to mind. Can you claim you're the creator of something and are being plagiarized when the steps you lay out in instruction books have been used repeatedly in various forms? Um, I'm not sure I, I know what the Inktober scandal is. Um, well, the Inktober scandal, basically there was an artist who wrote a book about ink drawing techniques Another artist was going to publish a book. It has not been published yet, but people are saying, the first artist accused the other artist. They said, hey, you copied my book. You copied the instructions going on in there. I mean, this, this is a hard question to answer. Um, assuming that, let's say for the sake of argument that these two authors never saw each other's work, uh, and that they both independently came up with the same technique, which happens all the time. There's seven and a half billion people on the planet. It stands to reason that at least two people are going to have the same idea at the same time. And in fact, history is riddled with, with <laughs> examples of, I mean, you know, the, the, the phone, the, the invention of the phone comes, comes to mind as maybe the most uh, obvious example of, you know, Alexander Graham Bell and Elijah Gray both invented the phone at the same time. And Alexander Graham Bell beat Elijah Gray by like two hours to get patent. Well, I mean, you know, this, I mean, it happens all the time. Einstein wasn't the only guy who came up with relativity. He was just the, the guy who came up with it first. You know, th- these, these things happen all the time. And so uh, assuming you can be, assuming the work come up with is uh, entirely self-generated and it's not, you didn't see the other guy's work and then just rip it off and claim you took it. That would be obviously a very, very clear cut case of copyright infringement or plagiarism. Uh, but if uh, if you came up with it independently and it just so happens to be the same as someone else, you won. Congrats. <laughs> just so you guys know, Greg has a website, The Legal Artist, and we have all of his links and his bio in the video description below. He practices in, I believe, Connecticut. Well, you tell me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm licensed. I live in Connecticut. I practice here. Uh, but I'm licensed to practice in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New York. Yeah, so please, if you guys have concerns or you want to hire Greg, he does intellectual property, business law, contract issues for artists, filmmakers, and creative entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Art Prof has a podcast, which is available on Spotify and also on iTunes. I will be hanging out in the Art Prof Discord in a few minutes in the post live streams channel. So please come chat with me about this stream. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel and join the Art Prof family. Thank you to our top Patreon supporters who keep us up and running, making sure that all of our content is free and accessible to everybody. And I just want to thank Greg for coming onto the stream and clearing up what for so many artists is incredibly confusing and vague and really difficult to get reliable information on. Thank you so much for being on the stream. Thank you to everybody for all your great questions. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.